free speech warrior Elon Musk sues to stifle freedom of speech again. Uh, Elon Musk filed his thermonuclear defamation lawsuit against Media Matters after the media watchdog reported that advertisements could appear next to racist or offensive tweets. The problem is he forgot to sue for defamation, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of legal problems in his latest anti-free speech lawsuit. I did not see that coming. Yes, when Elon Musk purchased Twitter in 2022, he met with representatives of several civil rights groups to discuss how the company would do content moderation going forward. Musk had vowed to make Twitter a bastion of free speech, and that had made many people nervous that he would allow banned accounts to resume posting. Musk promised to start a content moderation council to determine what happened to banned users. However, he didn't form the council, so the civil rights groups called on companies to pause their advertising on Twitter. Corporations like General Mills and Volkswagen stopped their advertisements. Musk blamed the Jewish Anti-Defamation League for a $22 million drop in ad revenue. He then gave general amnesty to suspended Twitter accounts and fired most of the employees who were tasked with monitoring hate speech. He also dissolved the Trust and Safety Council that had been formed in 2016. When the ADL reported that hate speech had increased on the platform, Musk said it was a lie and that hate speech impressions were down. He promised that the at safety account would begin sharing data, but the account only shared the data once. In March of 2023, the at safety account said that the company was defining hate speech more narrowly by evaluating slurs in the nuanced context of their use. Now, whether it's hate speech or offensive speech, the First Amendment protects hate speech from government censorship, but private actors like Elon Musk and corporations can make their own decisions about what they want to say. That has nothing to do with the First Amendment. So as the owner of Twitter, which is now X, but I'm still going to call it Twitter, Musk has a right to post any opinion he wants, ban or unban any users and promote offensive content. And also, individuals and corporations and advertisers have a right to participate on the platform or not. So in May, the ADL published a report about the rise in anti-Semitic hate speech on the platform. The group pointed out the obvious that by taking away the moderation guardrails, more horrible things were being shared. In June, Musk hired Linda Yaccarino as the new CEO. Now, she doesn't have all of the powers of a normal CEO, but one of her roles was to make good with advertisers. Musk threatened to sue the ADL, but later made nice with the group. Instead, he decided to sue a different media watchdog group, the CCDH. And at the same time, Elon never stopped promoting conspiracy theories. Which brings us to November 15th, 2023, when Musk boosted a post that said, Jewish people have been pushing the exact kind of dialectical hatred against whites that they claim to want people to stop using against them. Uh, this was a reference to uh, the white genocide or replacement theory and anti-Semitic delusion that suggests Jews are promoting immigration, same-sex marriage, interracial marriage, and pornography, and other things in order to destroy the white race. Musk appeared to agree with a post about white replacement theory, replying, you have said the actual truth. This interaction prompted some advertisers to flee Twitter, at least temporarily. And on the heels of this event, the liberal advocacy group Media Matters then released a report showing that posts containing pro-Nazi content appeared on Twitter alongside of advertisements from leading companies. As part of this study, the company created new Twitter accounts and apparently curated the interests of those accounts. The company report uh, alleged that, quote, advertisements have also been appearing on pro-Hitler, Holocaust denial, white nationalist, pro-violence, and neo-Nazi accounts. Media Matters found ads for Apple, Bravo, Oracle, Xfinity, and IBM next to posts that tout Hitler and his Nazi party on X. Uh, you can see screenshots of these posts here. At this point, I considered displaying the ads in question, but honestly, it's just really sad, and I don't want to promote these ads even in this particular context. Uh, just trust me, they're not great. In one of the ads, uh, a user sad because Nazis aren't running the world. Um, that appears next to an Apple ad. Another tweet is talking about how the Third Reich was good, actually, and that appears next to an advert for Xfinity. Bravo and Oracle share space with a user who believes the Holocaust never happened. Uh, and as we'll see in the lawsuit, Musk doesn't deny that the ads appeared, only that the Media Matters accounts had a very unusual set of uh, interests that led to a rare algorithmic feed. Now that report put Media Matters in Musk's crosshairs. He alleged the real reason advertisers fled was the Media Matters report rather than his own post professing agreement with all of this horribleness. In reality, both events probably played a role. And he promised to file a thermonuclear lawsuit against Media Matters, uh, the second that court opened. Of course, these days uh, you can file electronically, especially in federal court. You actually don't have to wait until the courthouse opens. And shortly thereafter, Musk promoted a Pizzagate meme. So anyway, uh, the thermonuclear lawsuit against Media Matters is now here. And uh, yeah, it is the slappiest slap suit that you can possibly imagine. Now we'll talk about the allegations in a second, but right off the bat, this is not a defamation suit. Uh, some legal commentators, uh, who should know better, really think that it is a defamation suit. Uh, they are really confident in asserting it's a defamation suit, and they are very wrong about that. This particular person is wrong about a lot of things. 
But while this lawsuit repeatedly mentions defamation, it does not include a defamation claim. Instead, there's a cause of action for a tort called business disparagement, which is similar to defamation, but in the business context with some key differences. Now, the torts of defamation and business disparagement are similar in that they both involve harm from the publication of false information, but they're different in the interests that they seek to protect in the way that they do it. Defamation serves to protect one's interest in character and reputation, whereas business disparagement protects economic interests by providing a remedy for pecuniary losses from slurs affecting the marketability of goods and services. Elements of business disparagement are more stringent than those of defamation because business disparagement protects against pecuniary losses. So the publication of a disparaging statement concerning the product of another is actionable when the statement is false, published with malice, with the intent that the publication cause pecuniary loss, or the reasonable recognition that it will, and pecuniary losses do in fact result. Now, the actual malice standard does apply because the plaintiff here is a public figure, and merely showing ill will or intent to interfere with the plaintiff's economic interest is not sufficient to establish malice. So like defamation, a business disparagement uh, defendant may only be held liable if the defendant knew of the falsity or acted with reckless disregard concerning it, or if he or she acted with ill will or intended to interfere in the economic interest of the plaintiff in an unprivileged fashion. And as always, a showing of truth of an allegedly defamatory statement negates the element of falsity for a business disparagement claim. So what are the allegations against Media Matters and its reporter? Well, the lawsuit alleges that Media Matters systematically manipulated the Twitter experience in order to defame Twitter. Now, as always, a complaint is a one-sided document that simply represents the story of the plaintiff, so it's no guarantee that it's accurate. But here the complaint says, quote, on November 16th, 2023, Media Matters published a false defamatory and misleading article with the headline, X has been placing ads for Apple, Bravo, IBM, Oracle, and Xfinity next to pro-Nazi content, claiming that X was responsible for anti-Semitic content being paired with X's advertisers paid post. This statement was not true and Media Matters knew it. As explained below and displayed in an X internal review, this title is false in that Media Matters itself, not X, was responsible for placement of the content and identified through its willful exploitation of X's user features. A result it specifically intended to bring about, X in fact has many default safeguards that prevent the platform from displaying content in the manner artificially achieved by defendant. So the crux of this claim is that Media Matters created Twitter accounts and then followed fringe accounts with the expectation that eventually offensive content would appear next to the ads. In other words, Twitter didn't deliberately place advertisements next to offensive content. Media Matters created the conditions that caused the ads to appear. Quote, Media Matters did not find pairings that X passively allowed on the platform. Media Matters created the pairings in secrecy to manufacture the harmful perception that X is at best an incompetent content moderator, a harmful accusation for any social media platform, or even worse, that X was somehow indifferent or even encouraging to Nazi and racist ideology. Now, other than the legal conclusions and certain adjectives that are being used here, I actually don't think that Media Matters would disagree with the facts as laid out in this allegation. It's true that Media Matters created the conditions for the pairings to appear by using the platform as it is permitted to be used by following accounts the user is interested in. The complaint says that Media Matters used the platform in a way the platform is able to be used, but that it did so with bad intentions. Quote, uh, next Media Matters set its account to follow only 30 users, far less than the average number of accounts followed by a typical active user, 219, severely limiting the amount and type of content featured on its feed. All of these users were either already known for posting controversial content or were accounts for X's advertisers. That is 100% of the accounts Media Matters followed were either fringe accounts or were accounts for national large brands. In all, this functioned as an attempt to flood the Media Matters account with content only from national brands and fringe figures, tricking the algorithm into thinking Media Matters wanted to view both hateful content and content from large advertisers. Now, this comment about tricking the algorithm is interesting. Now, metaphysically, I'm not sure that there is a thing that can be done to trick an algorithm. Um, I'm not sure that that's a thing that exists in the universe. But Twitter admits that users followed by Media Matters are known to post controversial content. The beef here is that what Media Matters did is inauthentic and inorganic. But of course, because Elon Musk, or as some people are calling him now, Space Karen, uh, because he pushed back, uh, that has caused lots and lots of other people to go digging for other examples. And as Mike Masnick has pointed out, they found them, a lot of them. Uh, so many of them. Now, lots of Twitter users are reporting that they found offensive content next to ads. As the Daily Dot pointed out, a bunch of users started looking around and found that ads were being served next to the tag Heil Hitler and Kill Jews, among other neo-Nazi content and accounts. And it seems these users didn't engage in any of the manipulative or inorganic actions that X accused Media Matters of using. They just followed vile hashtags and found monetized content. So the complaint continued, uh, but this activity still was not enough to create the pairings of advertisements and content that 
Media Matters aimed to produce. Media Matters therefore resorted to endlessly scrolling and refreshing its unrepresentative hand-selected feed, generating between 13 and 15 times more advertisements per hour than viewed by the average X user, repeating this inauthentic activity until it finally received pages containing the result it wanted, controversial content next to X's largest advertisers paid posts. But it appears that Media Matters uh, did not falsely report on the content that was found on the platform. It reported what it saw after it created the accounts. But it's not surprising to find racist or anti-Semitic content on social media platforms. Even with aggressive moderation, some posts will still get through. But Elon Musk and Twitter seem to be claiming that it's not fair for Media Matters to draw attention to these racist needles in the haystack. It doesn't seem like that satisfies the standard for making a false statement. Now, Elon Musk claims to be a champion of free speech, but of course, he filed a lawsuit to stifle the free speech of uh, Media Matters, uh, claiming that they have disparaged the company by using the site in an inorganic way, by repeatedly scrolling and refreshing until they saw what they'd hoped to find. Quote, Media Matters generated a specific intended result that was not only inorganic, but exceedingly and demonstrably rare, all while taking specific steps to obscure this in a November 16th, 2023 article. The overall effect on advertisers and users was to create the false and misleading perception that these types of pairings were common, widespread, and alarming. Media Matters hid its manipulations through omissions, deceptive image selections, misrepresentations, and secrecy settings. Musk says that Twitter safety measures, quote, under normal organic conditions operate seamlessly, contradicting seemingly every single Twitter user's daily experience. Now, as a viewer of Legal Eagle, you're probably not only very smart and very good looking, and you've probably already spotted the problem with Twitter's claims here. It admits that what Media Matters reported was actually true. Twitter calls the confluence events that led to the advertising context rare and inorganic, but rare and inorganic is not the same as false. It's actually more like the opposite of false. And as far as I can tell, Media Matters never made any claims about the frequency with which advertisers' advertisements appear alongside offensive content. And as Mike Masnick of TechDirk put it, uh, quote, Media Matters never made any such claim about how frequently such ads showed up. And as IBM noted in pulling its ads, it wants a zero tolerance policy on its ads showing up next to Nazi content, meaning that even if it's true that only Media Matters employees saw that content, that's still one too many people. Uh, you might remember Mike as the guy that coined the term the Streisand effect. I wonder if that term applies here. Now, the other two claims in this lawsuit are for interference with contract and interference with prospective economic advantage. Now, to prevail on a claim for tortious interference with a business relationship in Texas, a plaintiff must show that the defendant intentionally prevented the formation of the business relationship or contract, and that's not easy to prove. A plaintiff must establish that there's a reasonable probability that the participating parties would have finalized an agreement or business relationship, but for the meddling of the, the defendant. And crucially, the plaintiff also has to show some sort of willful and intentional in independently tortious act of interference that caused the damages uh, to the other parties or to prevent the contract or business relationship. In other words, generally speaking, anyone can interfere with someone else's contract. You just can't go about doing it illegally in the first place. Now you might've noticed that this lawsuit was filed in federal court in Texas, but you might not immediately know why. Uh, first year law students learn all about the different ways a court has personal and subject matter jurisdiction. And this takes weeks to learn. Uh, but here's a very fast rundown. Personal jurisdiction is the court's ability to exercise jurisdiction over the rights and responsibilities of a person. Subject matter jurisdiction is the requirement that a given court has the power to hear the specific kind of claim that's being brought in that court. Federal courts have subject matter jurisdiction uh, where there is a federal question or where the plaintiffs and defendants are all domiciled in different states. Now, one form of subject matter jurisdiction is called diversity where parties are from different states. And here, Twitter is a Nevada corporation with its principal place of business in California and Media Matters is a Washington Washington DC corporation. So the elements of diversity seem to be met, but it doesn't appear that there's any personal jurisdiction in Texas because nothing appears to have happened in Texas. It's possible that courts might exercise what's called long arm jurisdiction here, but basically because nothing happened in Texas, I would expect a motion to dismiss to get it out of the Texas court in the first instance. But there are some very good reasons why Elon Musk wants this case specifically in Texas instead of California, even in federal court. One reason is that this case could eventually be heard by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has issued some bonkers opinions related to free speech and social media companies. Now, some of the more astute viewers might be wondering whether Texas has an anti-slap law. And the answer is they actually do a pretty good one. But as some people may be shouting at the screen right now, uh, one of the Fifth Circuit's less bonker decisions involves the application of the Texas anti-slap laws. Uh, basically, the Fifth Circuit has ruled that the state's anti-slap laws do not apply in federal court. Typically, when someone is sued for defamation or something like defamation, they can argue that it's an attack on free speech and get the lawsuit dismissed early in the process. That's the point of an anti-slap law. But by filing the complaint in Texas federal court, 
Musk ensured that Media Matters would not be able to use the state law. And as I said, Texas has a pretty good anti-slap law. The Texas Citizens Participation Act was enacted to deter meritless lawsuits. It allows defendants to file a motion to dismiss a legal action that infringes on the rights to free speech. And a defamation or disparagement uh, lawsuit is the classic kind of lawsuit that should get dismissed uh, by an anti-slap law. This motion can be filed early on in the legal process, often before the case proceeds to expensive and costly discovery. However, because Elon Musk filed in federal court, Media Matters will not be able to use the TCPA to defend against the lawsuit. That's because a 2019 Fifth Circuit ruling stated that that particular state law doesn't apply in federal court. That's because the Fifth Circuit, uh, also with a number of other federal circuits, have decided that the state law is in conflict with the federal rules of civil procedure because the TCPA operates without pre-decisional discovery. So Media Matters will not be able to use the anti-slap law to fight this slap lawsuit. Now, Elon Musk has said that he may require Twitter users to provide identification to verify their identity, which sounds horrible for several reasons, including because it's probably only a matter of time before Twitter's data is hacked, which is why I use today's sponsor, Incogni. Incogni removes your personal data from online data brokers. They'll reach out and make sure it's taken down. And if these data brokers object, which I've personally seen, Incogni will take care of that too. Now, I don't know if you've ever Googled yourself, but there are major people search sites out there that probably already have your personal contact info. It might be because of a data hack, but sometimes our friends and family even provide that information voluntarily by clicking on one of those boxes when they sign up for a website or an app. These sites provide in-depth records, including information such as home addresses, contact details, license plate numbers, family members, financial information, even religious and political beliefs. And these sites can expose you to a wide range of dangers from scams to identity theft to online harassment and stalking. Now, it was very important to me that I not be on those sites and Incogni took that information down. And not only does Incogni stop marketing efforts, but it also reduces the risk of your information being part of a data breach or abuse and identity theft or stalking that you really don't want to take a chance with. Now, I'm constantly getting notifications that my information and account info was found in part of a data breach, but Incogni fights for you to have your personal data taken down from data brokers. Data brokers are required to remove your personal information from their databases if you ask them to, but tackling this by yourself would be nearly impossible because there's thousands of them. But that's where Incogni comes in. Incogni fights on your behalf to remove your personal data from data brokers and deals with any objections on their side. All you have to do is create an account and give them approval to work on your behalf. Incogni conducts repeated ongoing removals because even if the data broker removes your data once, they can collect it again. Incogni makes sure that your personal information stays off the market for good. It was fascinating for me to look at my Incogni dashboard and realize that I'm on hundreds of data brokers lists. So I guess it was no surprise why my email box was full of junk and my phone was constantly ringing with scam calls. Here's my personal Incogni dashboard. It shows here that there are three sites that had data on me that was rated 10 out of 10 on Incogni's sensitivity scale. These brokers had data including my contacts, financial data, and health data. And it's terrifying to see exactly how many brokers have my data, but it's really fun to watch Incogni get them to delete that info one by one. So if online privacy is important to you, give Incogni a try. Click on the link below to get 60% off Incogni when you use the code LegalEagle. Again, to get an exclusive 60% off discount, just click on the link that's on screen or down below in the description and use the code LegalEagle at checkout. And after that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.